Hello and welcome to Unacademy. As part of your NCRT fundamentals today, we'll be discussing Indus Valley Civilization from the 6th class and 12th class part 1 NCRT. Changing the tone from modern India, we are now discussing ancient India the second session. Now before we begin, as always a very important announcement for you which is the 23999 price which is a summit price is going to end very soon. In the next 3 days, this will be over and on 26 July, we are starting a new batch, the Achievers batch. So do make sure that you become part of the Unacademy family. With this, let's talk about IVC. When we talk about the Indus Valley Civilization, it is a generally an important topic for both prelims and mains because in prelims, you have in the past 10 years, two to three questions which have come through and in mains, because it is part of art and culture, it becomes generally an important aspect because of town planning concept. Now, the heads under which we will discuss are dictated by the NCRT. Wherever there is a gap, I will try to fill it up. Now, the first concept which we need to understand is what is culture wherein there are four metrics which have been used by the NCRT which is object, geography, time and continuity. When within a specific geographical area, within a specific time period, within specific objects and cultures, if there is continuity, it is one culture then a civilization. Civilization, there is a scale difference, cultures are small, civilizations are big and the time period which is given for Harappa is 2600 to 1900 but you will also find 3200 to 2600 as the early phase of the Harappan civilization. Then you have 2600 to 1900. Somewhere you'll find 1700 as the concept of what we call as the mature phase and 1700 or 1900 to 1500 the declining phase. Now, there's a lot of question after what happened after 1500 which is the Aryan migration is known. There's a lot of research which is happening in Rakhigadi with regards to how there's a continuity between the genetic pool of the Harappans and the and the uh, Aryans in that regard. That is an ongoing study. We will stay away from that as of right now till it is not established properly. Even the NCRT just talks about the DNA study of a woman who gives us evidence of intermixing of Aryan and Vedic civilizations plus the IVC, which is a, a very obvious understanding wherein obviously with migration there would have been interaction between the Vedic civilization and the concept of IVC and therefore there would have been some continuity for sure. Let us leave it to that as of right now. Let's see where that research goes because it is not a peer-reviewed article which came in the Hindu newspaper and the even the research which has been added into the NCRT only talks about the prospects of a dark age which was previously considered to be gone. Let's see where that goes. As of right now, we'll stick to what the NCRT says. Now, the next most important thing which you have to pay attention to in the NCRT is the map wherein all major sites from the northernmost which is Manda to the westernmost which is Sudka Gendor to Alamgirpur which is not quoted here but near Rakhigadi which is the easternmost and then you have the concept of Dehmabad which is near the Narmada river being the southernmost. However, all standard sites are known which is or are quoted which is Munjadaro, Kodizi, Amri, Dholavira the only UNESCO world heritage site then you have Lothal, Dockyard, then Harappa but you can see the distance between Mundaro and Harappa also quite important that way. Then you have Banavali and uh, Kalibangan and Rakhigadi. Rakhigadi important site. A lot of research is happening as of right now in this sector. Now, the first topic which is considered within the NCRT, though it's very brief, is subsistence pattern. Now, we already know that when we talk about subsistence pattern, it is agriculture, which basically is the mainstay. Along with that, we have animal husbandry and hunting gathering also. But if you do the genetic analysis of the diet, what we find in sites itself, we have fish, we have animal products, we have plants. We also have wheat, barley, lentil, chickpea and sesame what we call as uh, evidences and even millets have been found in Gujarat that was a very diverse very very diverse what we call as set of grains which they are consuming and archaeobotanists who basically work on the plant based archaeology aspect have talked about multiple seeds which are ancient to what we use today and therefore it is an agricultural society with concept of hunting gathering and the concept of animal husbandry also so the 
dietary practices are quite diverse as way that way now what does this mean this also means that the comp the society will be complex because agriculture is there agriculture leads to surplus production leads to the concept of complexity and subsistence pattern in a way is a testament to the diverse nature of the indus valley civilization people and its subsistence base now the next aspect which automatically gets linked to it is agricultural technologies what were the technologies they were using for agriculture here there is reference to plow plow share we know that they don't have access to iron so therefore it cannot be an iron tipped plow it is wooden plows which were used to till the soil itself plow plus irrigation work is something which is considered very important irrigation plus plow are two very important metrics which are used to talk about agricultural technology at this point of time we have found irrigation channels in for example uh, shotugai and all and plow have been found we have a plow toy we have plow uh, terracotta figurings and also we have a tilled field which has been found in banavali and rakhigadi that way agricultural technology was standard to its Uh, period we have copper being used in diverse ways but not as a copper tipped plow in that regard this is a very important point you need to understand now this part was a brief part of the chapter very uh, what we call as very well written but not does not have a lot of detail it is mohenjodaro which is taken as a example which is mohenjodaro is taken as example to show town planning now in town planning we already know the basics but we can revise it through the ncert which is the concept of citadel which is the upper town the concept of lower town which is the residential area in citadel we have all the administrative and what we call as public buildings in that regard from the granaries to the pub, to the grade bath to the college of priests on the other hand we have different sections of the lower town which are inhabited in the form of residential in a residential zones and one corollary which comes out of this is which you can see here also is 90 degree angle what we call as grid pattern grid pattern is something which is talked about in every book also but you already know which is that all the streets in except banavali were in a grid pattern banavali is the only one where it was concentric circles which is called radial grid pattern is without modern geometry without any modern technology they were able to create exactly 90 degree cutting north to south east to west streets so what is emphasized is the urban center of munjaro first lower town upper town uh, the lower town and upper town concept citadel and lower town concept second is the streets then everybody talks about drainage the concept of drainage is also quite important wherein every street on one side used to have fresh water resource on the other hand on the other side used to have grey water which is drainage so sewage lines and water lines were inbuilt into the streets some covered some open and in most of the houses which we see at this point of time there are toilets which is a very interesting aspect there is more or less 99% coverage of toilets across the whole indus valley civilization rudimentary ones but important and even there's a reference to how there is continuity in culture with regards to 1 is to 2 is to 4 pattern when it comes to bricks wherein it is believed that they used to build a platform a foundation on which they used to make the citadel and the lower town so as to give it a little bit of height and therefore we believe that the level of construction at the scale it was happening would have needed 4 million per uh, person days if we calculate it today that is the level of effort which went through. but what is even more interesting is the uniformity and the standardization which is 1 is to 2 is to 4 that 10 cm by 20 cm by 40 cm for the uh, city walls for, and 7 14 and 21 cm for the, the 28 cm for the house walls which is very very interesting the brick size was standardized that is something which is unknown that you are using 7 is to 14 is to 28 and using 10 is to 20 is to 40 cm brick across the whole civilization and it is already mind boggling how much effort would have gone to create a site like this now 
E.G.H. McKay is a very interesting historian. Talks about a lot of the aspects of the Indus Valley Civilization, but he has specifically talked about drainage. This is a very important point. Water management was one of the most distinct features of the Indus Valley Civilization, where he has basically described the drains of the Indus Valley Civilization at this point of time, wherein you have every house connected with street drains main channels had brick and mortar lining also and somewhere they were covered also in that regard in some cases limestone was used to cover them house drains first emptied into a, a cesspit then into solid settled then the wastewater was flowed into into the drainage channels and therefore it is quite sophisticated that they used to remove the fecal material they used to remove the gray water and then it used to get in a way channelized into drainage which used to be then sent into different what we call as cesspits and areas where it was then in a way decomposed. So that way is drainage pattern be it Lothal's dockyard is one of the most interesting aspects of the industrial civilization. So what makes it urban is not just upper town lower town but also the aspect related to drainage patterns, sewage lines, toilets and the grid pattern which is available in most of the sites. In certain sites, Citadel and Lower Town can also be fortified. In certain sites, it isn't. So that way, it is quite interesting that a civilization which is close to five to 6,000 years old was showing a lot of aspects which not even today we have in modern cities. This is a very important point which the NCRT also tries to push through and you should be very clear about this because what I'm discussing with you right now, what I'm discussing with you is also the architectural feature. So Mohenjo-Daro that way is becomes a specimen of arch uh, what we call as architectural and archaeological both. So when it is archaeological feature, it will automatically become an architectural feature and therefore it is going to be used to write if they say what are the salient features of the I IVC. Therein, drainage, streets, upper town, lower town, public private division and there is a specific aspect which has been talked about in the NCRT which is houses wherein there could be one story two story we have multi story buildings the main entrance of the houses did not open in the main street it opened in the side lanes there were no windows and doors towards the main street itself then you have what is called as the courtyard model which is the angan concept wherein all rooms are around a courtyard and there is standardization of bricks here also standardization of waste management drainage and water management that was quite interesting in that regard so even in household construction there is what we call a standardization so from house to uniformity and sanitization to the aspect related to drainage and streets and urban planning these are things which you write for the mains and the prelims examination you can get statement based questions now an aspect which the ncrt then moves on to is the concept of social differentiation which is was their social differentiation a lot of books say that ivc was uh, for example patriarchy, patrilineal, women were subjugated, this and that. However, with no written source, with the writing, the, the script itself not actually deciphered, we have no idea about that. We do understand gendered based division of labor is there for sure but not at the level which other books or the standard books even suggest the the ncrt also talks about the same thing but it talks about the concept of rich and poor that is their social differentiation into elites and the people who are common people and that is understood the through the concept of burials it talks about burial goods meaning in certain burial pits we find just no lining, in some we find mortar lining, in some we find the concept of brick lining, in some we find grave goods, in some we don't. Now this is indicative of social differentiation. We are not fully sure but it is. Where the NCRT leaves it in grey is, it could be a practice in different communities within the IVC but it is in a way confirmed through jewellery being in certain 
uh, what we call as burials in, in, and not in some of them. So therefore, therefore, the idea is we have diverse burials at this point of time and some have goods, some do not have goods, some are well maintained, some have specific peculiarities that could be indicative of social differentiation. So there is a question which I will show you in the end. How do we understand social differentiation is through dietary patterns, through the concept of upper town, lower town, but also through the concept of pottery ornaments and the idea that we have fi we find something in certain spaces and we don't find something in certain spaces. That way is quite interesting when it comes to understanding the society of the IBC. We have no clarity with no literature, with no script being deciphered. The Boston Fenden of Harappan Jalishan not been deciphered till this point. We have no idea about the specificities. It is a complex society. It is divided. It is genderly divided. But we have no other what we call as evidence then henceforth. Now, the chapter then moves towards craft production and it gives you a very beautiful summary of the different craft activities which are being done in the IVC, which is from the concept of bead making to shell to metal to seals to weight making and the best aspect of this chapter is it gives you the sources of where you get the raw materials from. This has not been a very standard thing. They have not asked you this question, but they are talking about the diversity of material. Very important for art and culture wherein we find beads we find jasper we have shotu guys sending lapis lazuli semi precious stones and even the shapes of the pottery themselves are numerous wherein we have different types of pottery when we talk about pottery there is a very specific thing which is we don't find human figurings but very rare that way but what we find is geometrical patterns and the diversity of proper uh, pottery tells you that there's a diversity in subsistence pattern and how they were using this pottery also so that way is it is quite interesting it is quite interesting that the clay terracotta and the pottery at this point of time can be molded in different ways so craft production is diverse craft specialization is diverse craft techniques are diverse and therefore that is represented in pottery in this in the objects which we find now linking this up with the idea that where were they getting this material from and that is indicative of internal and external trade that is indicative of internal external trade wherein what we believe is that there's a very beautiful internal trade where carnelian seatite seatite which is used to make seals is coming from rajasthan is coming from gujarat is coming from northern afghanistan and there is a movement within the ivc which is indicated through the production and the diversity of what we call as materials and techniques but what is even more interesting is this material diversity is also there when it comes to the international trade because we find in Mesopotamia Meluhan or Harappan as the language of the Mesopotamians and the script have been deciphered which is cuneiform we know that they refer to certain things which are coming from Meluha and they actually are indicative of Harappan civilization we believe that the Harappan civilization was trading with the Mesopotamian sector was trading with Central Asia at this point of time also the Dilman and the Omanian sector, the Magan, this whole sector, we find a lot of both back and forth, import also, export also. And we find what we call as birds, cats, even animals being transported from India towards the Mesopotamian civilization. At the same point of time, we have Mesopotamian objects being found in Meluha, which is Harappan civilization. More than that, a very interesting aspect has come through, wherein there has been an analysis of the copper, which was used in India and used in the Dilman and the other sector in that regard. What has been found is that Oman was supplying copper which is Omani copper and Harappan artifacts along with traces of nickel show what we call as 
a common origin so it could be that the omanian sector was also sending metals we know that the industrialization gold was coming from the kgf kolar which is karnataka that means that there is internal trade with the non harappan chalcolithic cultures also and in that regard the omani angle is very interesting which is omani sites are yielding harappan jars at the same point of time in the copper which we found in in india has omani origin and that is indicative of a very flourishing trade and relationship between magan dilman mesopotamia and the indus valley this is what this what makes indus valley civilization so unique modern and important which is the fact that there is interaction both in the internal and external trade level in that regard this is a very important point so the mesopotamian myth of meluha was that the haja bird is coming and we believe that the haja bird is basically reference to peacock confirms to us that mesopotamia was trading with meluha which is mesopotamia uh, which is indus valley civilization now what we have established till this point is subsistence pattern is diverse a lot of grains and different forms of food are being used we have also established that there is social differentiation based on the aspect related to what we call as the uh, burials we have also understood the urban planning and uh, the uh, mohenjadaro sector being an example of how urban planning was happening and last but not the least we have also established that what makes ivc ivc is internal external trade not just within the indian subcontinent but with the whole central asian sector west asian sector that is quite interesting interesting that ways now what is interesting and also indicative of a unified polity when it comes to polity we don't have a lot of clarity is seals script and weights when it comes to scripts we have no idea the script which we you see here has not been deciphered in any way or form the script has not been deciphered at the same point of time what we see is a very interesting concept though the script is not been deciphered so we have no real idea in that regard about the nitty gritties seals and weights tell us one thing which is uniformity and standardization is there for sure therein lies this concept that we have found weights which are in binary and they are using it across the civilization which is that we found stone called shirts basically the shirt stones are used as weights they have their own binary system of weighing but they don't use modern mathematics that ways and and metal scale pans were used to even measure and understand this is a very interesting aspect which is that without we have no clarity with regards to what is actually happening we don't know what is the political nature of the state itself but we do understand that because this is standardized across this whole sector there is uniformity there is standardization means there is a mature polity for sure which brings us to this question that what kind of polity is there if you been in for example optional history if you will go there is a very long debate over the political nature is it the priests is it merchants is it a mixture of both is it a, uh, what we call as autocratic state it is a mature state or is it what we call as a simple state but for gs level understanding one thing is clear upsc will not ask you a question on polity because there is no clarity here there is a lot of debate we believe that with the priest king concept that it may be a priest because the aspect of religion tells us that male and female goddesses were there and gods were there we know that animal worship and uh, what we call as animalistic or naturalistic religion is there we have the pashupati seal to actually even confirm that to us further we have also various seals in which uh, tree worship has been talked about so we know that the priest aspect is there were they controlling the state we also have merchants the shrin ratnagar who argues that it was merchants who were controlling that is why standardization in a lot of different aspects including weights now that is again a question which we have to understand until unless there is no text or the 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 seals are not deciphered to the script we have no idea so before we move on to the questions which are given and we end the session please understand what we are trying to do here it's not an extensive chapter it is not exhaustive it has a lot of examples but what you have to understand for the ivc generally 
is the aspect related to first polity we have no clarity because the script is not known script is not deciphered therefore lot of it's an archaeological based understanding therefore we cannot fully establish everything it will always be based on speculation theories here script we will need time it's a very inter, it's a very difficult script to decipher with 440 to 460 different what we call as pictographic symbols subsistence subsistence pattern is diverse agricultural economy then internal external trade is known and town planning is the most important aspect which is upper town lower town drainage the concept of 90 degree angles the, the, they used to make sure that grey water and fresh water did not mix, toilets, cesspits and dockyard at Lokthal and Dholavira water management, reservoirs, wells, very very important. And therefore, you have to make sure that you know the basic sites, you know the basic features, that is enough to write an answer for example like this. Describe some of the distinctive features of Mohenjo-daro. Basically, this can be made into describe the distinctive features of IVC. So, you can talk about town planning, you talk about subsistence pattern. Then, list the raw materials that were required for craft. This is a very NCRT type understanding, but this tells you where did they get it and what was the resource. At the same point of time, you can get these two types of questions. Quite interesting for practice. You can practice these questions. How do archaeologists decide on social economic differentiations? in Harappan society. What are the differences that they notice? This is based on burial pattern. And would you agree that the drainage system is indicative of town planning? Yes. Give reasons. Talk about the uh, streets having drains and you can also quote EGH Mackey. That way, this survey of the IVC through the NCRT, which NCRT does gives you a lot of information also, but not a lot of information may be relevant for UPSC. But as a chapter, it allows us and gives me an opportunity to revise it with you. This NCRT fundamental series specifically for history is to revise and create a foundation. Once the foundation is done, then a book like R.S. Sharma would make sense to you. So with this, I would like to end the session. Thank you so much. I will see you soon with another set of issues and another set of NCRTs. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. NCRT books are unavoidable to crack the IAS exam. Not only is the content of these books authentic, but these books also help a civil services aspirant to build conceptual clarity. And most importantly, lots of questions in the civil services examination are directly asked from NCERT books. But the aspirants often find it difficult to cover these books or worse, they even end up ignoring these books. We at Unacademy IAS English are going to make the reading and understanding of the NCERT books easier. We present NCERT Fundamentals course, a free initiative of Unacademy IAS English. What are the highlights of this program? comprehensive coverage of the most relevant NCRT books for the civil services exam. Prelims and mains practice questions in each session to test your understanding of the fundamental concepts. This course begins from 12th of July every day at 6 p.m. right here on our YouTube channel. Subscribe to the channel now.